Okay, we will start with the last actor of the day. It's an uh, enormous honor to have Roger Diner with us today. Please welcome Roger Diner. Hello, good evening. Uh, thanks a lot um, <coughs> for inviting me. It's uh, almost like a pilgrimage for Swiss architects to come to Porto. And uh, it happens to me uh, every time I come here. It's really a very specific uh, experience. So I will uh, try to uh, present our work by different projects. Sorry. It's, not, it's yours. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay. So, let's start. Uh, <clears throat> in a competition design, in, uh, it was in 1999, a hedge retraces the floor plan of the synagogue that was destroyed in 1938 and marks the place as a memorial. A 3.5 meter high hedge encloses the central nave of the synagogue, which stood on the same spot. The hedge is trimmed along its inner surface to retrace the interior space of the synagogue. On the outside, the hedge is left to grow naturally. Uh, is there a pointer here? Sorry. Maybe. Oh, thanks a lot. Huh? Or, or maybe I can show it with the... Uh... Anyway, I go on. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... So on the outside, the hedge is left to grow naturally. Visitors are to experience this interior space enclosed by the hedge through a single opening, a gate. Besides, you can only enter on November 9th every year. So that was our concept. The uh, November 9th is... Uh, uh, in 1938, the synagogue was destroyed uh, by a fire by the Nazis. A delicate relationship between forgetting and remembering emerges from the contrast between the parts of the hedge that grow freely and those that they are trimmed inside. The monument would keep its meaning only as long as the hedge would be carefully trimmed. Once the energy to trim the hedge would expire, the monument would lose its identity and become what it seems to be at first sight, a small and ordinary green space. This unspectacular and moreover unrealized project seems especially suitable to illustrate some of the interests we pursue 
our projects in European cities. The first issue relates to time. We try to relate our designs for a specific site to the history of this site. This is not primarily about making our designs more weighty or, and, or meaningful, rather this double reference to the present and the history of the site is to provide it with an inner dynamic, the very opposite of weight, that is. Outwardly, the hedge is a somewhat wild volume, not a burden for everyday life in this residential neighborhood. In fact, if children had slipped into this space to experience this strictly designed clearing, even thought unable to understand it as yet, we should not have considered this to harm the monument. The second issue is the ordinariness of architecture. This is connected to the first topic. We like it if the inhabitants casually appropriate the architecture by use, by using it, the way Walter Benjamin described it. These are simple, often familiar, anonymous images created by applying contemporary construction standards. We do not shy away from them, but our designs turn them into something you could call a repetition différente. In fact, the special effect of such an architecture only becomes visible at second glance. <coughs> A model uh, yeah, of that edge. The idea of a building being something permanent and the idea that a design could testify not just as a contemporary design gesture, but to the complex and rich identity of a specific site fascinates us from our very beginnings. Fascinated us from our very beginnings. It is about artifacts that have gained meaning based on the different conditions and aspects that relate to the site and to the program and that have, in the end, shaped them from the inside and the outside. This is a position that deeply relates to our experience of European cities, their eternal metabolism of destruction and reconstruction, and their painful and endless history. When we design a new building, we feel that our design practice is always being conditioned by what we extrude from a site as its permanent identity. We have never felt limited in our potential to express ourselves by attempting to keep alive the identity of a place, a site, or a built structure as we ended or transformed it with a contemporary design. On the contrary, it has turned out to be a continu continually inspiring mode, the very source of our specific way of designing architecture. Let me say one word about uh, this scheme, this uh, <coughs> obligation to keep it all the way, to run it in a permanent way to uh, to save that specific shape of the Neve, of the synagogue, that works, that seemed to us uh, really uh, important. And uh, by chance, I spoke with uh, the French artist Christian Boltonski a few years ago, and uh, he told me about the similar work of his, which I found really striking. It was his contribution to the cont 
competition in Berlin, the memorial of uh, uh, the six uh, million uh, Jews uh, that were killed, and it is the memorial that I think Peter Eisman and uh, Richard Serra finally um, um, uh, realized. Uh, and the concept of Christian Boltanski, he suggested just to do a very simple um, space and to put one chair and uh, one should sit there and read the names of all those uh, 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 Jews that were killed and his concept was that only as long as you would find volunteers to read those names the, the monument uh, would keep also its meaning and its uh, shape because uh, he out of the same uh, consideration I guess uh, he said he found that uh, Mem uh, to memorate is a work to do, is a commitment, and that should be a permanent work, a permanent gesture, and um, memorials should not just be placed as such. Now, uh, to a very different work of ours, much more in the inner central field of uh, architecture uh, about um, yeah, ten, 10 years earlier. Uh, the Gmurzinska Gallery, an art gallery in uh, Köln, Marienburg. The shape of the Gmurzinska Gallery in Köln was influenced by the specific program of the art gallery. The building designed in the 80s has sometimes been exclusively related to those examples of Soviet avant-garde that the gallery has systematically collected and published for so many years, that means since the, 50, the late 50s, I guess. However, it would be wrong to merely consider this Red House as some kind of late reflection or only to consider it as a kind of a late reflection of this progressive uh, concept, post-war uh, concept and vision of the art gallery, which they were researching and publishing uh, uh, catalogues about uh, the Soviet avant-garde um, in a permanent way. To us, the red color is not without significance. In this park, the color red as a complementary color contrasts with its background of green trees and bushes. As a matter of fact, it was the first time we did not design a house in uh, the set city center. Red is a warm color too. It seems to appro approach the observer. At the same time, red establishes a kind of coherence. The color red enabled us to design the individual surfaces of the building without losing its appearance as an entity. Red paint protects the wooden cladding, which in turn protects the entire structural part. Thought the two red cubes may indeed be seen to simply recall revolutionary art. Their design is rooted, as, uh, as a matter of fact, in the no tradition, more in the tradition of a rural Nordic classicism. Their distinguishing feature is the empty tympanum, or better, the empty monumental sopraporte. This extends beyond the structural system 
also its dimensions almost exactly correspond to the exhibition hall halls behind it. So you see the floor plan and the larger, higher, uh, sorry, yeah, the larger, higher hall that you have seen in the elevation and there the of the smaller exhibition spaces of the enfilade. <coughs> the floor plan <coughs> shows the same aspect of a parallel presence between the different parts as it is evident in the elevation. The three smaller cabinets and the large exhibition hall are placed adjacent to each other different proportions, sizes, and types of natural lightning distinguish the different kinds of spaces. That is to say, the, their floor plan reflects the contour of their elevation and vice versa, Th something that uh, appears very often in our work. Okay. The extension of the Swiss Embassy uh, about 10 years later designed. <clears throat> so I'm going, I, I'm going forth and back in a certain way to show those schemes to make it more better understandable what it is about. The project for the Swiss Embassy in Berlin consisted of two major operations to, to convert the existing Stadtpalais into an ambassadorial residence and to construct an ad additional building to house the offices of the consular services. The former Stadtpalais is a historical landmark because it is the last remaining building of the Alsenquartier. The elegant neighborhood was partly destroyed by the Nazi to prepare the field for Adolf Hitler's megalomaniac Ruhmeshalle and partly by the bombs of the Allied armies. It was in the shadow of the lone Stadtpalais that the Russian troops prepared to conquer the Reichstag the, and thereby bring the Second World War to its uh, symbolic end. So it was this uh, building that uh, turned out to become so meaningful and was by the, really the only, the only building that was not destroyed. You, you can see it there. And by the way, this is the edge of the Reichstag. So you see the, once more, again, only the edge of the Reichstag, but there this new Bundeskanzleramt, the, uh, <coughs> and there the very little, strangely enough, the Swiss uh, embassy. The splendid design of the Spand des Bundes, as it was called, for the new German capital, including the new governmental buildings, expresses the desire for a new identity for the symbolic center of the German state 
after the German reunification in 1990. Our scheme for the Swiss Embassy basically started from a very different thought. Primarily, we wanted to preserve the memory of the history of this place in the 20th century. With our concept to extend the Palais, we tried to avoid erasing the traces that were left by these painful demolitions and to recall the murderous violence of the Nazi period. The new concrete, uh, <coughs> sorry, the raw concrete provides the building with an archaic look. Thought obviously related to the Stadtpalais, even without the characteristic neoclassical ornamentation, sorry, uh, oh. uh, mm -hmm. I will show you uh, elevation of the hole afterwards, obviously, that was one was left. Uh, it, it does not look like the new like a new building, but more like a timeless, basic version of a building. The wall has openings, but the traditional windows are absent. The walls of the front facade of the extension do not look like uh, they hide offices, but a system of uh, atriums instead. On some projects, we cooperate with artists. Such cooperations concerned those aspects of building design that cannot possibly be realized and expressed by the, me by the means of contemporary architecture. A place acquires its identity over time and through complex relationships that include beautiful and ugly good and bad, permanent and transient aspects. To integrate these into building and turn them into permanent parts of it is what ultimately interests us the most and what stim stimulates us uh, <coughs> mainly <coughs> the most. This is why we expose our projects to such operations and do not shy away from allowing such interactions to characterize the identity of a building. The artist Helmut Fedele designed a relief for the west wall as an integral part already of the competition entry. This was cast on site in rough industrial concrete. Fedele's relief invokes the memory of vanished buildings, of the vanished buildings, a wall with just a concrete grid that is blank and repeats demolition as well as reconstruction. Throughout all the facets of this project, the past remains present as a volume and as a void, as material, texture, and color. One more photo showing also uh, the whole part of the Stadtpalais and the extension and the relief of uh, Helmut Fedele, all also in a kind of a, a intention to create a more monumental shape for these buildings that, as a matter of fact, they, they are so little in size compared with all the government building and the Reichstag uh, nearby. <clears throat> so, 
uh, an aerial view of uh, the island that make, is part of the former port area of Amsterdam, which uh, went through an urbanization uh, process in uh, the 80s and, and 90s, and uh, with uh, uh, your Kunen and your suitors as uh, um, urban designers <coughs> that were in charge. The houses that we proposed in this case refer to the characterization of the island as port of the historical docks of Amsterdam here. The assign uh, assignment seeks to respect the historic identity of the island and place the entire facility in the context of its neighboring commercial pier and the examples of old harbor architecture. It is to say that uh, really the whole urbanization process um, uh, was organized in two parts. It is, by the way, uh, yeah, it is this uh, part of the uh, this so-called island, the, uh, and uh, it was urbanized following two different uh, um, uh, ways. One, two different urbanis urbanistic patterns. The upper one by your uh, by suitors who referred to the historic center of Amsterdam that, by the way, uh, you see there behind, and completely, um, made uh, completely lost this idea of a former industrial port area. And also um, the, the nearer part designed uh, by Jokunen also uh, referred more to uh, this kind of uh, well-known large-scale housing schemes like the Wiener Höfe. And there is also one of them was designed uh, by Hans Kohlhoff and Helga Timmermann, uh, one of the most beautiful and impressive housing uh, uh, schemes, by the way, of that time. And uh, our a contribution was the last one was just in the edge here in the central edge where you uh, come to the, the at the entrance of the island and it was called the gate of Java Island it was considered also to be such a large operation that you would even go below the building buildings as a huge buildings organized as a huge gate and um, contrary to the other competitors or some of them, we um, suggested just to refer to the lar to large buildings of the port, former port area. There is one, by the way, that was anyway kept um, a, a large dock house. So, Yeah, you see here uh, the kind of traditional, even with Krachten, the system uh, of um, suitors, while here you see the three the, or four large operations. Here should have been the, the last one. And uh, not the afterwards, uh, basically we suggested contrary to the competition brief to organize just one large buildings, both of them related with that uh, memory of the port and of the transfer of goods from the water, one from the water to the, uh, to the island, this one that is built in the water 
and the other one more in an idea that from, the, from that island uh, uh, to the city. So, <coughs> uh, in, just let me see, yeah, in such a context, it is not only the new buildings that need to find their meaning, the old buildings also need to be integrated into the project and in doing so, to be recreated. It is the aim of this approach to establish a specific balance between all parts, between the old and the new. This is an important uh, issue. So, only, so this is one of the landmark buildings. It was the old Arbeitsamt, very impressive, where the workers went every morning because they were only hired day by day. And then there were here houses, smaller houses, series of smaller houses for the captains. And uh, there, those, this house, these are houses of the company that was running the port business. And this was the one dock house. So by, our, by the splitting our buildings, we tried to create a composition in which also the older parts, a kind of constellation in which also the older parts were kept by the new and the new by the old uh, existing ones. Distinct from the other large residential houses on the island, with their play of windows, lodges, and balconies, the, that uh, what we call longhouse displays only a single window type. By shifting each opening by half a stone, the opening lose the abstract geometrical character of a grid type system. The expression of a rough archaic building structure remains the um, predominant characteristic. So the other uh, house that I've shown you in the site plan, the, what we called courthouse. This is the regular floor plan. You see the predominant structure also um, well-known from um, dock stor storage buildings and the apartments organized by a, a balcony from there, the entrance, and it was uh, housing not for traditional families, but for a kind of uh, individuals that they would uh, live together. So what we suggested it was a kind of series of identical individual rooms and the same size of room organized opening to the balcony, uh, entrance balcony that they would uh, share. There was just one size of uh, space, about I think 28 square meters. And so this, those apartments almost, uh, they, are, they are like squatting. It is not that the stru building structure and the floor plan is organizing also the shape of the building, like uh, we know it in, tradi in a traditional way of, the, of modern architecture. But it is more that the given structure than is um, within the given structure, the, uh, the, the, the floor plan finds its, uh, its space. It is maybe more like, a, uh, it looks more like a conversion, like if the structure would have been there before. Yeah. So the reference to old storage or trans uh, shipping buildings 
led to new concepts to organize our residential buildings, particularly for the so-called courthouse. The regular grid of the load-bearing structure became the driving force to organize the apartments. What led us to this radical design was our exploration of the existing built structures at the old commercial port. Thanks to this, we managed to maintain the identity of the specific space of the port, even though the program called for an urbanization that comes with the risk of uh, completely shifting the identity of the place. So here, one of those uh, beautiful, impressive storage buildings. But there is another reference, too, that is worth to be mentioned. It is the organization of collective housing in a social utopian vision by a courthouse such as the Familister in Guise, designed by Jean-Baptiste Godin and Charles Fourier, uh, about uh, 18, around 1850. So this is this famous uh, original photo, which of course is related uh, to that inner space. There is also bricks, also one could not, there are bricks like outside two of both houses, but here they are glazed in two different green colors. The, um, the two sides that they are more in the shadow are in a darker, darker green shade than the, the ones that they re, uh, are facing uh, west, uh, south, uh, so south and west, that they are in lighter so to enhance the effect of the light coming into those courts. Now a more recent uh, scheme, still within the same uh, I, uh, aspect. I, as you could see, I don't show the complete uh, uh, projects and so, so, but only, I have chosen only those images that they illustrate this kind of uh, issue about uh, the, 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 the memory. <clears throat> so this is a site plan of uh, Novartis campus in Basel, a pharmaceutical industry, one of the large ones internationally uh, uh, working firms and they transformed their original uh, a plant to, uh, from, fab uh, from fabrication to research and um, uh, to research and um, development and management, of course. And this, uh, there are many uh, different contribution of our architects today. The first three or four were organized by competitions. The, f the ur urban design plan is done by uh, Vittorio Lampun uh, Maniago Lampugnani, and he was also uh, a kind of advisor at, uh, throughout that process to, for the choice of uh, architects that were commissioned but as I said, the first ones were, um, uh, uh, were run by competitions and we were invited in this first one and it was about the kind of entrance building should become the flagship building in a certain way. Here is the gate to the, the entrance to the overall uh, campus. So uh, it, it was um, also not only the first building of the new campus, but it was also the first building of that company 
where they switched to what they call open space, space offices. And that was really a kind of a, the most important issue for the company because it was the pilot project for uh, about 75,000 working places all over uh, uh, the world that they wanted to change to what they call open space offices to improve communication among the collaborators. So this was the kind of main issue of the company and for the company much more important than any kind of uh, aesthetic design uh, issue. So <coughs> for us it was uh, kind of a big change also in this scheme because until that moment the relation of the interior and the urban space outside, the exterior, uh, wo uh, was organized in our schemes by the openings, by the windows and, uh, and this was a kind of a basic uh, given issue for, for us until that moment where we did not have any more clearly defined interior spaces but just one large space all over the floor plan uh, to, to, as, a, as a condition to organize this kind of uh, membrane also this kind of issue uh, for the skin of that building. So a network of colored glasses, glass, uh, glass uh, panes, panels, replaces the uh, traditional facade with its uh, rows of windows. In physical terms, the window was dissolved and in doing so became omnipresent. Together, the structure, space, and shell create a whole. It is not just the individual windows that have been dissolved, but also the separate rooms inside. Each floor, as I told you, is an entire space now. One showing you the floor plan of those spaces. And uh, in, by the way, we showed another kind of analogy in the competition presentation. We uh, suggested to understand this floor plan almost like the plan of a traditional city in the understanding of uh, Italian rationalist uh, 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 theory and uh, description of Aldo Rossi that you, um, in your, the mental mapping of such a city is organized by the monuments that they are permanent while the city in all these uh, areas of uh, working quarters or residential quarters is in an ongoing process. So we enhanced this kind of uh, strong elements that they had to do with the daily work of uh, the uh, collaborators as the places to be kept also as um, a kind of a uh, floor plan in, uh, in your uh, mental floor plan and the other parts to be completely free to the changing, ever always changing uh, organization of that company. So here an image through the, from inside and you see the uh, slightly discolored glass that is very strong from outside, which is not as strong at, at all from inside. 
So the Swiss, the Helmut Fedel worked again with us, very different from what uh, we have seen in Berlin, and we, we knew, but we knew works of his, I wouldn't show now those references from his early work in the 50s that reminded us. So we went, we asked him whether he could organize that building in such a way. So even though the uh, facade has some brightly colored glass panels, its overall light remains fluid and clear, paradoxically, even though this uh, multicolored mosaic encloses the entire building, it does not feel closed off. Air seems to circulate around it, just like the movement of someone's eye beneath its transparent envelope, the building appears like a vast window. So the whole building appears like a vast window. Fedele's artistic intervention can be described as architecture, but equally as well as art, or as neither nor. It creates a plasticity at the immense boundary between the two disciplines, bringing into play different types of colored glass. In Helmut's own words, it's uh, worth, uh, very short. Uh, um, this geometry is neither subject to compositional considerations, nor does it seek to be spectacular. Its decorative quality, of which I am quite conscious, expresses an existential visionary grandeur. The aim is to add beauty as meaning to the rationality of the form. So just to finish uh, about that project, this was the former original floor, uh, uh, site plan of this production site very early, beginning of this century, uh, of last century, sorry, and it was for the production of color, for, uh, for the, uh, to, to color fabrics. This was the beginning of the pharmaceutical industry and in, in a, this to dye fabric. And in this, at this um, uh, extent, one can also see in the work of Helmut Fedele this kind of uh, reference to the former and original identity. So, a uh, recent project it is a historic museum of a smaller city in Switzerland, Aarau, and uh, it's housed in a Schlössli, in an older part since 1939, which is on the right side. And it has been transformed, uh, this uh, monument has been transformed uh, for many times. The, uh, it was built in the 13th century and always extended and tr transformed. And the, the project of the extension, um, which we designed together with Martin Steinmann, added a new wing to the museum. So you see the what I call the new wing is the whole left part, by the way. In this section, it looks uh, like that. Uh, it it um, includes the large staircase, which unfortunately in this publication plan is not uh, designed, uh, which are, is here, uh, relating, linking all the different levels, which was crucial and difficult from the old and the new, the old and the new building would, and, uh, um, and also linking the towers twisting and turning corridors that before were almost inaccessible. So I go very quickly that you get just an impression how that uh, looks like. 
from inside and outside. So this is those, this large new staircase with a, that were are already exhibition spaces by, they are by themselves on each uh, half uh, floor and lead to the older and of course to the new parts too. And in the old parts there are also this kind of traditional uh, uh, spaces uh, like uh, one calls it them period rooms that they are reorganized, were reorganized from other buildings that were torn down, they were saved and then built in this kind of old uh, uh, tower that was transformed throughout the time. So this is the last floor with the studios and uh, offices for the museum staff. Meanwhile, the plants in the third year are much uh, stronger. They had to cut them already. And this is now the work also on the skin uh, uh, reliefs of uh, Josef uh, Felix Müller. So, no, let me quickly remain here. Uh, mounted on this wall, which is 12 meters high and 25 meters wide, is a monumental work by Josef Felix Müller. It is made up of an ensemble of 134 vertical rectangular wooden plates carved, uh, carved from wood that bear human portraits. Commissioned in 2009, the artist used the wood of a mammoth tree cut down to make way for the museum extension. The competition had a wild, um, was a wild thing because we suggested the extension on the, wrong, on the other side that the, uh, the competition brief asked for because on this side everything worked perfectly well also urbanistically to create the kind of uh, public space in front together with the neoclassic uh, uh, public building on the left side, but was not uh, at hand because of that uh, huge tree that was there. And we suggested anyway to put the extension there, which after all was the only reasonable way to do. And finally, there was a public vote about whether that uh, tree could be cut to give place to the museum, to the new wing of the museum. And fortunately, um, the, yeah, it, it was accepted. That concept was accepted. So, uh, so uh, Josef F Felix Müller, uh, he used the wood that of that tree uh, that to cut those uh, reliefs and they are life-size uh, figures and uh, we those um, that tree was organized to of course had to be organized to those 134 plates and he was doing that uh, in an incredible way he did it uh, free hand, as you can see. He had only some sketches, but on a, uh, somewhere apart, a and he had to do them all, each one in within 15 minutes, because otherwise uh, the, uh, the instrument the, to cut uh, the, uh, became too heavy to, to be kept. So this was, by the way, there is a uh, documentary on this whole uh, process of, uh, of, of that work of Josef Felix uh, Müller. And of course, afterwards, the wood uh, was cast. Uh, uh, this was the negative 
first there, were, there had to be a, then a negative form and then it was casted in concrete and the built facade is then of concrete of the concrete plates which of course they also are in a dialogue to the very strong uh, um, uh, work stonework of the former part of the existing part so uh, the r most recent here the last uh, photo the most recent uh, project is uh, uh, the uh, work on uh, the Foxal Gallery Foundation in Warsaw that um, inhabited the upper floors of that interesting building uh, of the early 60s that was built as a corner in a neoclassical ensemble that was uh, part of the reconstruction of the neoclassical reconstruction of the center of uh, Warsaw and but uh, it was completely this was a historic photo and uh, it was uh, in a extremely bad shape and it was impossible to, to keep that old facade and it was also uh, not so uh, uh, appropriate, of course, for the for the um, uh, demands of the of the art gallery of uh, Foxal. So here is uh, the. But let's go fast. It's too complex now. It makes not so much. Okay, let's immediately go to this new facade. Uh, so the, we, uh, we took the, the light motif for us from this kind of a corner building, its uh, figure and structure in contrast to its original condition, the concrete facade of the renovated building now uh, invites a wide range of dialogues and uh, interactions between inside and outside, between mass and void, a quality due not uh, to the concrete panels and uh, framed windows. So you see that kind of uh, play between openings and um, closed surfaces is, of course, uh, the issue of these uh, interior spaces where you have that play also uh, throughout the different uh, floors. So uh, the Foxal Gallery uses the three top floors for their work and for exhibition space. And uh, there is also uh, additional roof terrace that uh, is also considered to be a specific exhibition uh, space. To this end, alternating fa facade elements which either contain framed glass or concrete panels structure and define the buildings externally, its short side corresponding to the width of the single panel, the long side to the two panels. These elements make the continuous arrangement of the internal exhibition spaces evident in the outside. As a matter of fact, it's what I explained to you already um, in the early Gmurzinska gallery, which in a different way uh, is also uh, working here. The, on the on ground floor, it's a barber shop that uh, remained untouched, by the way. So this is, unfortunately, this is a publication section. There is a one beautiful one to 50 sections and one to 20 sections showing uh, the way we, the, the, the load, the, the, the panels, the heavy uh, panels, concrete panels are put one on the other. They are not uh, 
they're keeping themselves. They are not load-bearing, the load-bearing structure that, of course, we could not, uh, couldn't have done. But uh, there is, of course, also the kind of uh, um, uh, mode that we, uh, we experienced that has, of course, a lot to do also with the time of modern, um, of, of modern uh, post-war architecture in those Eastern uh, socialist countries uh, where pre-cast uh, pre uh, pre, uh, production was done in, by heavy concrete casting. So in a certain way, since, by the way, the Foxall Foundation is also, was also researching since the early uh, 80s about uh, modern art during the time of uh, socialist, of the socialist uh, 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 a ruling where modern art was really um, had uh, was almost impossible to 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 run. Uh, they were researching about those artists and their work and efforts to make that publish uh, since the the, the uh, since the early 80s. And in a certain way, this uh, this kind of uh, parallel. Uh, aspects with that time of uh, the uh, of the post-war period uh, had also to do, of course, with that uh, choice. So, roof terrace, yeah, and this kind of positioning that is really kind of a, was a careful work to do. As you can see, it is almost uh, like a wooden structure composition cladding uh, Strickbau. And by the way, uh, in Poland, there were people, uh, there were students and so on, and that they wrote because they thought that the Polish were unable to to organize it correctly, our scheme, which they considered to be more kind of uh, 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 clearly hard-edged, shaped, but this was a, a kind of a perfect quality, how the building was built up. Uh, we wouldn't, we consider this as at least as good as it would have been done anywhere in uh, Switzerland or so. So the law, I think, uh, I come almost to the end. This is a project that is under construction in Rome. It is uh, called the Via Giulia Garden, and it is, you can see it in this. Of course, it is that site where that was the law for now many years, a kind of uh, archaeological site and was uh, um, uh, carefully, carefully uh, researched as an archaeological site. So the Via Giulia was built in the Renaissance Rome uh, to uh, dissect the medieval space and impose a sense of order on the city. This was this kind of incredible really breathtaking axis, sorry, that was built uh, throughout uh, this cut and uh, demolished in, uh, and, sorry, and um, in the thirties, Mussolini demolished historic buildings to make way for this uh, planned boulevard from the Ponte Mazzini to the Corso Vittoria Emanuele in the 30s. So something that reminds us also on, this, on the Berlin uh, site happened here again. Uh, Mussolini wanted to create axes 
towards the historic center and, uh, and torn down historic buildings, preparing that axis that then was never built. <coughs> uh, the street, the failure of this major project by his fascist government left a vacant plot and land at the height of the, uh, of the Piazza della Moretta that uh, stood um, empty now for almost 70 years. Here was this Via Giulia before it was the buildings were demolished, and here it is how it looks today, still, or how, yeah, how it is today. A new wall runs now, describing very shortly that project, the new wall runs parallel to the houses of the street facade in one place, the wall opens onto the Via Giulia. It frames and fixes the experience of the newly captured streetscape without uh, neglecting and suppressing the wounds that were inflicted here in the 30s. That means that, as a matter of fact, we were invited to, to the competition that intended to rebuild here houses, contemporary respectful houses to recreate the former shape, section, and um, uh, uh, profile of this, uh, of Via Giulia. And uh, contrary to the other competitors, we uh, suggested this public garden on, uh, uh, above that, uh, archaeological field which covers two-thirds. One-third is not an archaeological field but is a kind of, is a public uh, parking below which was not part of this kind of uh, debate and uh, competition. Instead of replacing the demolished buildings, we decided to make the garden the guiding principle in reconstructing the street profile Neither buildings in a classical nor in a modern style could have restored the former unity of the Via Giulia. Contemporary buildings would have ne uh, negatively affected the balance between the older and the more recent houses which provides the street with its identity. High walls seemed to us the only suitable means to once again complete the street profile without destabilizing it as a monument. That means we really felt unable to, to build here new houses in whatever style ever. Also, there are other houses at the beginning of the, this, uh, of the 20, uh, 20, beginning of 20th century and uh, there is, of course, also uh, uh, the, the garden wall of Palazzo Farnese on that street. But this, I think, is an interesting issue that I think whatever building would have been built, it would have um, uh, had a strong impact on, on Via Giulia. So this, th th this concept was not immediately accepted at all, and with the, the mayor at that time that wanted to organize this uh, public-private partnership uh, was not interested once the jury and also in a public, kind of a public vote, uh, uh, the majority was in favor of that concept, and it was abandoned for a few years, and uh, then we had only two years ago all of a sudden a phone call and the project was again on the table. So this is the project. The garden itself is uh, designed uh, <coughs> by uh, Vogt, La La Günd Vogt and uh, Vogt Landscape Architects. This is then a model 
a working model of the garden that will be built. So I finish with this uh, uh, project, uh, which is the extension the way, uh, also of a uh, wing, uh, the east wing of the Museum of Natural History in Berlin that was destroyed in the, during the war, last, last month of the war, which was never rebuilt because the German Democratic Republic, they didn't have the, the, uh, the money to rebuild, uh, to restore this wing. And so a competition was held in, I think, 1994. And uh, then it was also, um, we could not work because there was no money left. Also, uh, the, the competition brief offered uh, and asked for a complete uh, restructuring of that large museum, one of the five large museums worldwide of natural history with uh, millions, I think 34 million of um, specimen and object. And so what was decided was that the most precious of all collections should be or reorganized in that wing that was dis uh, de uh, destroyed and only doing so afterwards uh, then uh, the museum would have enough space to, re, to be reorganized ta uh, by um, re uh, restoring parts of the part, and this is a process that is running now. So we are, as a matter of fact, since 1994, we were carefully starting only with the, a budget for annual kind of housekeeping, more or less, but then got this kind of uh, one uh, um, budget uh, uh, as a research institute. It got a European budget for this, uh, the new wing to, for that collection of um, mainly fish, fishes that they were kept in 370,000 glasses with, um, um, uh, with in alcohol. So this is then this kind of, it's a research, it's part of the, um, of the university, it's a research museum, and also this is one of the important research issue, this uh, large collection, and we organized that the collection would still be uh, 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 part of the, the w had to be kept in research conditions. So we created this kind of inner organization for that research field and the public could on ground floor just walk around but had no more indications. They just could look at them almost from behind but the, the whole organization of all those specimen follows is in a changing process following the research demands. And uh, so this is really a kind of a view in the, uh, in the daily work of the researchers. So this is the section that shows the organization all over the floors. This is the always six uh, uh, six or seven meter high floors divided to reach all those objects in two and that one is the one that is publicly accessible but there are of course uh, the other floors too as important as that one and research laboratories on the ground on the lower basement and uh, and on the upper floor so this is how um, it looks like from inside, walking, uh, it's almost uh, so sometimes frightening to see all those uh, specimens. And this is how it looks. So the new facade consists of the remaining 
wall fragments from the largely destroyed building and the pale gray concrete inserts. In this manner, the new facade recalls the original entity of the facade without negating its uh, history. The move might be compared to a painting Tierschicksale by Franz Marc, which is part of the collection in the Basler Kunstmuseum from 1913, a painting by Franz Marc that was damaged by water uh, uh, during the First World War and was restored by Paul Klee in 1919, who complemented it, the destroyed shapes with achromatic additions. Still, and it's a really a, a great example uh, to show, you see the right part that was repainted by Paul Klee and creating by that again the, uh, the, the, the identity and the quality of the overall composition without losing the specific uh, condition of that uh, part uh, of the painting. It's, I think it was, it's a really a revealing uh, example, more revealing than architectural uh, references. And this is then how that looks like. You had seen at the beginning that some part of the old were still uh, kept, and this, the new part, is completely cast in concrete. And the firm that cast it, that brought, took the forms, by the way, from the second uh, not destroyed co uh, co wing, of course, from the central wing. The firm that they made those uh, models is the same firm that works for the museum to, um, to create the missing parts of the dinosaur bones. And we only found out on the opening that they worked with the same firm. And here you see it was a really ambitious work to do. This uh, is the, uh, the negative form and uh, uh, cast, then the casting, and then finally the way uh, there were those surprisingly heavy elements until 43,000 kilos, uh, the heavy parts, and we insisted a lot be, uh, that because that, that work had to be, to be perfect or, or not at all. So this is finally how it uh, looks like. And this is uh, the overall restored facade of that new west wing. Of course, the conditions for the, for the collection was extremely high. It was also completely unthinkable that the new uh, the, the, the new um, facade could have openings and windows, no light, no uh, nothing. Uh, it had to be on 18 degree, degrees because of explosive risks. So it is really a kind of a so solid, thick wall, and the existing, uh, the existing openings they be closed by bricks, by bricks, real bricks uh, uh, too. Okay, so I finish with that image and thanks a lot for your patience.